Okay. So I'm going to begin today's lecture by um, doing a few examples to illustrate the point about why um, we care about orthogonality and why we um, want a bunch of vectors to be orthogonal and why we want them to be um, not or, not just orthogonal but orthonormal. Right. So here's a few examples. What's what's so nice about orthogonal vectors? So let's consider the following examples first. Okay. So let's let's consider this trivial example that we have of one zero and zero one. The nice thing about these two sets of vectors is, well, if you know um, calculus or if you've been following the lectures closely, then you know that these are the standard basis for the two dimensions. And you can get the whole two dimensional plane by just taking zero, one in the one direction and the other direction is one zero. And you can traverse the whole plane by just um, scaling these two vectors and adding them together and you'll get the entire two dimensional plane. Um, of course, these are not the only uh, basis vectors for the two dimensions. You can get other bases as well. But what's nice about them is the following. Notice that when you take the dot product, so let's call this vector i and let's call this vector j. When you take i transpose j, what do you get? So you get 1, 0, 0, 1, right? You get the result is just 0 because you can easily see that there's going at a 90 degrees um, from each other. And so they're orthogonal. So that's the first term that we need. The other thing that we uh, that's really nice about these two vectors is that their length, if I compute the length of one of them, so for example, if I want to compute the length of the i vector, then that's just the square root of 1 squared plus 0 squared. And that's just 1, right? So not only is um, the length one, we can also just say when the length is one, then of course the length squared is also one. So that's nice. And we know that the formula for length can also be written just as i transpose i square root, or the length squared can be written as i transpose i. Same is the case for j, right? So if we want the length of j squared, that's just j transpose j, and that's also, of course, if we take 0, 1, and we multiply it by 0, 1, take the dot product, and you get 1. So the length of both of these vectors is also 1. And that's the other property that we want, that they're normal vector, that they're unit or normal vectors, right? They're normalized. So that's the combined term. We give these vectors the combined term of ortho normal vectors, right? So i and j, i, j are orthonormal vectors. And not only are they orthonormal vectors, they're, when they're orthonormal, of course, they're independent. And so they are they're the orthonormal basis, orthonormal basis for R2. OK, that's the, that's the first example, right? So of course, now I can. Um, that's not the only 90 degree angles going at a 90 degree. Uh, I can construct another example. Um, in two dimensions, we can look at the rotation vector. So let's call this R1, which is cosine theta. And this angle is something that you can take um, 0, pi by 4, pi, whatever you want, cos theta and sine theta. And the other vector that I'm going to take, R2, is going to be minus sine theta and cos theta. And again, you can check that both of these uh, vectors are orthogonal in that R1 uh, transpose R2 is going to give me minus cos theta sine theta plus sine theta cos theta. And as we expect, their dot product is 0. And not only that, but if you take the dot product of one vector with itself, R1 transpose R1, that will give you cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta, which by basic trigonometric 
uh, identities, we know that to be one. And so is the case with R2 transpose R2. That's just equals to sine squared theta plus cosine squared theta, which is equal to one, okay? So we're at this point going to define um, orthonormal, orthonormal vectors. And we define them as follows. We say that, and it's not necessary that you have just two. I'm going to give you an example where there are more than two vectors as well. And the idea is that, so we use Q1, Q2, dot, 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 Qn are called orthonormal, orthonormal vectors if the following is true. If Qi transpose Qj is equal to that, if you take the transpose of two vectors, then it should give you zero when i is not equal to j, and it should give you one when i is equal to j. And you can see that in this example where we were taking the transpose of R1 with the dot product of R1 with R2, that was just zero. But when we took R1 transpose R1, that's one, R2 transpose R2 is two. And this is basically, again, it's nothing new. It's just we're saying that this is saying that they are orthogonal vectors, and this is saying that the vectors are normal, okay? It's just saying all of that in a concise little mathematical notation, right? So again, in this one, you can see that when the vectors were different, the dot product was zero. When the vector was same, the dot product was one, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, I'll give you a couple more examples before we um, get to a bit of the why of why we cared about these, right? So another three-dimension example, you can quickly uh, create for yourself, which is one, zero, zero. That's just the standard basis vectors I'm taking again, zero, one, zero, and zero, zero, one. Okay, that's another example. Uh, yet another example, which is something that we'll come across or maybe check it out is, I'll give you this set of vectors, right? So minus one upon three, two upon three, and two upon three. So that's my first vector. My second vector is going to be 2 upon 3, minus 1 upon 3, 2 upon 3. And the last one is going to be 2 upon 3, 2 upon 3, and minus 1 upon 3. Again, my claim is that these bunch of vectors are orthogonal to each other, and they're normal, right? So if you take their length, that's going to be 1. And if you take their uh, dot product, that's going to be 0. There's actually a nicer way of writing these three vectors. If you just, you, you can see that the, the factor one upon three, the denominator three is common for all of them. So you can just take one upon three common for each of these vectors. So this becomes minus one, two, two, and one upon three, two, minus one, two, and one upon three, two, two, minus one. So that's a nicer, easier way of writing the matrix. All right, so this is a nicer way of writing those three vectors down, okay? So these were the examples of orthonormal vectors. Okay, let's look at what's so nice about them. So why, why do we need orthonormal vectors? Okay. So orthonormal vectors have a bunch of nice properties. Two properties that we've already seen is, of course, that their dot product is zero and their, um, their, their length is one. But when we talk about applications, there's some um, nice little properties that they can have. For example, if you consider, if you take, so for example, if I take the matrix Q, let's say I make a, so first I'm going to make an orthogon, orthogonal matrix Q. So orthogonal matrix is a square matrix, square matrix Q such that the columns, the columns are also normal. Okay, so here's for example, another Q matrix. And also in this lecture, I'll be using 
not just symbol Q for orthogonal matrices, but I'll also be using Q as a symbol for um, not just square matrices, but rectangular matrices as well, uh, who have orthonormal columns. But those matrices will not be called orthogonal matrices, but we'll still be talking about them because they have nice little properties. So Q, for example, is a matrix cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. So I know that Q has been constructed out of two columns, Q1 and Q2. Both of these, I've already seen that they're orthogonal and they're normal. So they're orthonormal vectors. And here's an um, example, here's a sort of a experiment that I want to do that I'm going to compute Q transpose Q, right? So I'm going to take the transpose of this matrix. So the transpose of this matrix is going to be cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta, and multiply it with uh, Q itself, which is cosine theta, sine theta, minus sine theta, cosine theta. And if I multiply them together, what do I get? So the first entry is going to be cosine theta, cosine theta, sine theta, sine theta. So that's just you, you see that it's just taking the, so if this was, if you think of it row times column, then you can see that it's just the transpose of the first column being multiplied by the transpose by the original column itself. So this is Q1 transpose. So this is Q1 transpose Q1, and that's just simply going to be equal to zero, one, sorry. The next one is minus sine theta cosine theta plus sine theta cosine theta, so that gives me zero. This one is minus sine theta cosine theta plus cosine theta minus sine theta, so that's zero. And this one is sine squared theta plus cos squared theta, so that gives me one. So when you have orthogonal matrices, Q transpose Q gives you the identity. What does that tell us? That's, that's a nice little property to have. And we'll see that that's not just true for square matrices, this property is going to be true for rectangular matrices as well. But when you have square matrices, then you have the nice little property that you can see that if two matrices are being multiplied and the result is the identity matrix, and that tells you that Q transpose is actually Q inverse. Right, that, that the inverse of this matrix is nothing, but if you just take the transpose and that's it, that's the inverse. You don't have to do any fancy calculations. You don't have to do anything. You just transpose that you have the inverse. So that's, that's nice, right? Okay, so what else? Let's, let's consider the uh, rectangular case. Rectangular case. I'm calling in the rectangular case. This is not, again, I repeat, this is not an orthogonal matrix, but we still, uh, just for the sake of similarity to remind us that, or let's just, I don't know, I've got W maybe, one zero zero, and the other main column I'm going to take will be zero zero one. So what I've done is actually, if you think of the third example that I gave you, one zero 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 one zero and zero zero one, I've just taken Q one and Q three, and just not included Q two in my matrix. But even then, we'll see that we get some nice little property, which is, what if I do W transpose W? Okay, so this is one zero zero. 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so this was a two by three matrix. This is a three by two matrix. The result is going to be a two by two matrix. So that's the first sort of difference. So I do get a square matrix. And what do I get? So this column times this, this row times this column is just one. This row times this column is zero this row times this column is zero, and this row times this column is one. So again, even when you have the rectangular case, you have W transpose W giving you the identity matrix. So that still holds. Of course, the dimensions get a bit messed up because it's a two by three matrix and a two, three by two matrix. And if you do W, W, W transpose, that's also give, going to give you the identity matrix. But you can check that that's not going to be the same as this because that's going to be a three by three identity matrix. So let's just, maybe we can try that out as well. So 
let's see if I do 100 and 001, and then I do it with uh, this matrix, which is 100001. So I'm so this is a three by two matrix. This is a two by three matrix. The result is going to be a three by three matrix. So what's that going to be? This row times this column one. This row, this column zero, zero. This row, this row. This is all going to be. Huh. This doesn't give me the identity matrix. Okay. So zero, zero, zero. Oops. Looks like I was wrong. So it gives me something similar to the identity matrix, but something is missing. Zero, one, zero. So this is zero. This is zero. And this gives me one. Okay, so what happened here? It did give me a three by three matrix, but the problem was that it, give, it didn't give me the three by three identity matrix. And the reason it didn't give that is because this is actually a rank two matrix, right? The reason for that is there are two independent columns and you cannot build a matrix of three independent columns when you're using the same matrix of two independent columns and two independent rows. So it's being constructed out of two independent independent column. Okay, so WW transpose doesn't give me the identity matrix, so I have been corrected. Okay, so this is not equals to identity matrix, but this is almost the identity matrix with the um, pivot, some missing pivots, right? So I can say some missing pivots, but this definitely W transpose W because it's going to give you the lower dimension, though this is still a rank two matrix. So a rank two matrix in two dimensions is giving you the identity matrix. But a rank two matrix in a three dimension is giving you, not giving you the identity matrix. Okay. All right. Okay. So what else? Why do we care about? Another nice property of orthogonal matrices. So let's call it the second. Have I numbered the first property? Okay, so let's let's number it. So let's number one. So that was the first nice property of orthogonal matrices or orthonormal vectors. Okay, so second property. If you have, if you take x, if this is an x is a vector, and you multiply it by q, and if you check its length, then that's going to be the same as the length of x. That is the length of x remains unchanged. And maybe you can, as an example, I can tell you about the rotation matrix. So a rotation matrix, if Q is a rotation matrix, a rotation matrix, then all it does is it rotates the vector. So for example, if I have a vector x that looks like this, and if I multiply it with Q, then Qx is just going to be rotated but of course, nothing changes in its length. So its length remains the same, but the vector changes. So the length of Qx is the same as x. So this is an example, right, as an example. So, and you can see why this is true, and I can show you that the length of x is actually x. So this I can write it as square root x transpose x, right? So let's try this out. What is this? This is square root Qx transpose qx, right? That's how we take the length of a vector. So we know that x transpose x. And I can then simplify it as follows. So qx transpose I know is x transpose q transpose qx. And that I know to be q transpose q is the identity matrix. I know that for sure. So that's just i. And then I just have x transpose x. And that's it. So this tells me that the length of the matrix which has been of the vector which has been multiplied by in an orthogonal matrix is going to be the same as its original length. So it doesn't change the length. Okay, so that's that's also nice. What else? Dot products are also preserved. So dot products are also unchanged. And you can see that from here as well, and we can do another example. So if I take Qx transpose qy, that's going to be the same as x transpose y. These q's almost, they don't even matter, right? And you can see that by rearranging them. So x transpose q 
queue transpose. The reason I changed the order is because remember A, B transpose is B transpose, A transpose, okay? So Q, Y, and that's equals to X transpose identity, Y, and that's just X, T, Y. Okay, so it's all the same. Okay, and the last little property that we cared about, and remember that if you saw the last lecture, then we talked about projection matrices and projections and uh, projecting onto a column space or, you know, that sort of thing that we did. Um, remember that if we said that if you can't solve, um, if we can't solve, if we can't solve AX equals to P, then the next best thing to solve, then try solving A transpose AX is equals to A transpose B. So you solve the normal equations instead of solving the original equations, right? And here's a nice little thing. If A, if A is equals to Q, then what do we have? Then we have, again, this is A can be a rectangular matrix as well, but on the left-hand side, we get Q transpose QX is equals to Q transpose B. And what do we get? We get a nice little property that Q transpose Q is just identity times X is equals to Q transpose B. So it, so these Solving the equation just becomes simple. You, as long as you have an orthonormal basis, and if you have an orthogonal uh, matrix that you can replace A with, then you get X is equal to Q transpose B. So if, if A is ortho, orthonormal or orthogonal, then you can do this. So if A has orthonormal columns, you can do this. X is equal to Q transpose B, okay? All right, so that's the first half of the lecture which tells us why we care. So these are four nice properties that you get if you have at the start, um, if you have some nice vectors such as this, right? So if you have this one, first example, or you get uh, cosine theta minus sine theta, or if you get these vectors, right? So, but that seems limited, right? It, it's great if you have orthonormal vectors, but most of the time we don't really get orthonormal vectors, right? So for example, if I just make up an example, I'm sure I won't be able to get orthogonality or even normality in there. For example, if I get, if I take one vector as one, 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 and the other vector as one, two, three, well, they're independent, but I can immediately see that they're not orthonormal, but they are independent. Right? So here's what's important. Here's the remaining part of the lecture. The remaining part of the lecture is actually telling us that we can make, we can construct orthonormal vectors out of a set of independent vectors, right? And that process is called the Gram-Schmidt process, okay? So that's going to be the remaining part of the lecture. Okay, so Gram-Schmidt process tells us that if you have a bunch of vectors, so if we take these two vectors as an example, we can convert um, into, convert them into a set of orthonormal vectors. And what's really going to happen if I give you a visual sort of a intuition of what's really going on is that you have a two-dimensional space for now. We're just going to restrict ourselves to two-dimensional dimensions. And so the idea is that you have two vectors that are good enough for spanning them. So these vectors are good enough to span them because they're independent. At least they're not on the same line. And so you can get all sorts of uh, combinations and you can get the entire plane out of it, right? And what the Gram-Schmidt process will do, so the Gram-Schmidt process is going to give, you, give us, 
we're going to still be in the same sort of we're going to be in the same two-dimensional plane but what will happen is that these two vectors so for example let's call them a and b we get another bunch set of vectors so we get let's say one is in this direction the other vector will be in this direction so actually let's make them smaller so that they're so one and two and what's going to be nice about these two vectors is that they're going to span the same space but they're going to do it in a nicer way the nicer way being that they're 90 degrees so you're going to get a sort of the same way that you get the two dimension Cartesian space that's how you're going to get the same space okay and the nice thing about these two vectors let's call them x and y we'll have x transpose y to be zero and x transpose x to be one that is they're going to be unit vectors and they're going to be um, orthogonal to each other and this is just a two-dimension example right so this is two-dimension example you can also have three dimensions same thing happening three vectors independent giving you three orthogonal vectors orthogonal bases rather right so you can even say that x y are an orthonormal basis orthonormal basis for this plane okay all right so let's let's um, get to the main idea let's start by discussing how we perform the gram schmidt process okay I'm going to divide the Gram-Schmidt process into two parts. The first part that we're going to do is let's suppose if you have a bunch of vectors A, B, and C. Out of first, will they're neither orthogonal, they're neither normal. Their, their length is not one, and they're not orthogonal to each other. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to orthogonalize, orthogonalize them, right? Um, and this is the Gram part of the process, right? So Graham suggested that you can have this process and you can make them orthogonal. And so you're going to get, so U, V, W, out of these three vectors, we'll have three different vectors there will be, which will be orthogonal to each other. And then what you can do is normalize them. Right? So that was, so Schmidt came along and said that, you know, you can make it nicer by just normalizing them and making the length one. So then you get Q1, Q2, Q3. And the condition is that these three should be independent. If they're not independent, you're not. If they're not independent, just get rid of the vectors that are not independent and then make an independent set and then get a orthonormal set out of it. Okay. So in textbooks, by the way, these two, these two uh, steps are given as just one step. Um, if you notice that normalizing them is basically turning vectors into unit vectors. So turning vectors into unit vectors and the way you turn if you remember maybe i think cal2 then the way you turn a vector into a unit vector is just by dividing right so this part is just easy this part is just saying q1 you take vector u and you divide it by its length if you do that it's going to be a unit vector so this normalizing part is easy you just divide them all by their length Okay, and I'll do an example so that you can recall how we do this, but it should be fairly simple to do. This process, although, this is the one that we're going to discuss in a bit of a detail. Okay, so let's start. Let's say we have two vectors, A and B, and they're not orthogonal to each other. So now I want to construct um, U and V out of them such that I get orthogonal vectors. Okay, so let's pick the first vector. For the first vector, by the way, u, we don't really need anything because this vector doesn't need to be orthogonal to any other vector. So the first choice is easy. You just take u as a, right? Now when you start thinking about the second vector, that's when you want an orthogonal vector, right? So 
Now to this vector, I need another vector that's orthogonal to it. So I need something that's going in this vertical direction, sort of, right? Okay, and this, if you remember last lecture, we have seen something like this, that is a vector that is going in this upward direction that is coming from sort of P. And the thing that we did was, if you remember, was that when we were doing projections, so when I was trying to find the projection of B onto this space, I did have an orthogonal vector E, this E vector, which was B minus P, right? This was P, where P was X times A. So this vector is the orthogonal vector that I need. So for the vector V, I can choose B minus P. And how do we construct P? Well, that's just B minus X times A, if you recall. And that's just B minus the formula for X that we constructed in the last lecture was the following. It was um, A transpose B divided by A transpose A times A. Okay, so that's the formula that we're going to use. Okay, um, in this formula, I'm going to do something different. Since we replaced, we picked U for A, or we picked A for U, I'm going to replace all of these A's by U so that I get A. I'm no longer caring about A. I'm caring about the vector that we have already picked. Right? So that's my orthogonal vector. So I have two orthogonal vectors. The first was U, and I'm guaranteed that this new vector V that I have picked, so now I have A vector U, and I have another vector V, which is orthogonal to it. Right? So that's, that's the first process. Okay, now what about W? So let's construct the third vector, W. Okay, um, before we do that, let me just verify. Okay, let me not rush, right? Let me see if I've done the right thing. So let's do a little bit of verification. Verify that V and that V is actually perpendicular to you. How do we make sure that what we've done over here is correct or not. The way we can do that is to, if two vectors are perpendicular, then I know that V, um, v transpose U or U transpose V is going to be zero. So in this formula, let me just check. Let me just do a little verification. And let me just check that that's true. So if I take U transpose on both sides, so. I get U transpose V, that's U transpose being multiplied by this formula B minus U transpose B over U transpose U, U, okay. Notice that this is a number because this is a dot product. This is also a number, this is a dot product. These two are vectors. So I can rewrite this as U transpose B minus U transpose B upon U transpose U. I don't touch the numbers, this scalar I'm going to uh, leave at the start, and the rest is U transpose U, okay? So in this formula, what I get is that U transpose U is, so these are three dot products, you can see. So this dot product can cancel out with this dot product, and what you have is U transpose B minus U transpose B, which is zero. So it works. The formula that we have written out works out nicely. Okay. So let me just clean this up. Okay. So now let's talk about constructing W. Constructing W is going to be a same, similar pattern. What we want is we now we want, want C. So there's a third vector that we want, which is going to be sort of think about projecting it onto both of them, right? So it's sort of, think of it like this. It's going to be a projection. It We want it to be vertical like this. So we were, we're going to subtract a projection from this and a projection from this, right? So what we get is C minus, we do a similar thing where we do um, Q transpose C upon U transpose U times U. And then we also want to make sure that it's, it is perpendicular to um, the new vector that we've created V. So we do minus V transpose C upon V transpose V and then V. 
okay? And so notice that what we are essentially doing when we're constructing more and more orthogonal uh, vectors is that we're trying to subtract these um, projections, right? So this was the projection of C onto U, this was the projection of C onto V, and we're trying to subtract all those projections. And let's verify again, let's, let's do a verification that this is the right formula. Verify that W is perpendicular to V and W is perpendicular to U. Okay, so we want to make sure that this set of vectors that we've gotten is perpendicular. How do I do that? I do that as follows. First, I want to check V transpose W. If it's actually perpendicular, then I'm going to get well, orthogonal, I'm going to get zero. So what do I get? V transpose C minus U transpose C over U transpose U, U minus V transpose C over V transpose V, V. Okay, what do I have? This is V transpose C minus the scalar part you can leave out at the start, and then that's just V transpose U minus V transpose C upon V transpose V, and then C transpose. So I've multiplied V transpose with this U, with this C, and this V, right? These are, these are the vector parts, and the other parts are numbers, the dot products, right? Okay, so what do we have? We have the following. We have, notice that V transpose U, V and U are already have been established to be perpendicular to each other. So V transpose U, that's the nice part that, all, that this part is going to cancel out. So this is just zero. So V transpose C, this is zero. And V transpose V and V transpose V, these can cancel out and you get minus V transpose C. So you, again, these two terms cancel out and you get zero. So I know that V is perpendicular to W. And again, if you try to do U transpose W, you get the same thing where you get U transpose C minus U transpose C minus zero, which is zero. So U is perpendicular to W. So that's a nice little method. So what was the process? Let me just repeat. So the Gram-Schmidt process was as follows. I had A, B, C, out of which I got U equals A. Then the second vector was V equals to B minus U transpose B upon U transpose U times U. And then C vector, which was W, equals to, um, let me, C vector was W equals to C minus U transpose C upon U transpose U and subtract V transpose C upon V transpose V and V. Okay, and you can sort of see that if you want another vector, let's say if you want a D vector, another fourth vector which was perpendicular, then the process UVWX, that will give me um, the, the idea would be to take the vector D and then start subtracting all the projections. So UTU, U minus VTD, VTV, V, and another projection that you will have to subtract now, which is from the third vector, which is W, for W transpose D on W transpose W, W. Okay, so that's, and so on depending on how many vectors that you have. That's the branch. Okay, so let me just um, go back to what I was saying. I said we have two vectors. I'm doing an example now. So we discussed that you orthogonalize them and then you normalize them by dividing them by their length. Okay. So we're doing the example now where I have two vectors. The sixth vector that I'm going to pick is going to be that same vector. The second vector V is going to be done using the formula that we just discussed, that is B minus U transpose B upon U transpose U times U. So let's just compute what all of these things are. This is just the vector P. Then you have U transpose B. So this is U transpose B is just one, 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 being taken a dot product with one, two, three. And that's just going to be one plus two plus three, which gives me six plus six. And then U transpose U is just going to be the dot product of U with itself, which is one, 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 which is square root of, which is three, sorry, not square root, but three. And then the vector U itself, that's one, 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 okay? So, 
we have 1, 2, 3, and then minus, that's just 3 upon 2 is just 2, so this is just minus 2, minus 2, minus 2. So the vector that I have is minus 1, 0, 1. Okay, that's vector V. And let's just check for the sake of verification. I tend to make lots of computational errors, so let's just make sure that we've done this correctly. U is 1, 1, 1, and the claim is that V is the vector minus 1, 0, 1. And are they orthonormal to each other? Let's compute U transpose V. They're orthogonal, not orthonormal, of course, because we've not normalized them yet, 1, 1, 1, and minus 1, 0, 1. And that's, of course, minus 1, 0, 1. That gives me 0. So the orthogonalization process is done successfully, right? So we went from A equals to 1, 1, 1, and B equals to 1, 2, 3, to the orthogonal vectors U, which is 1, 1, 1, same as A, but V was minus 1, 0, 1. And now we can normalize them. So the way we normalize them is we take Q1 is going to be U divided by its length. So U is just 1, 1, 1, but what's its length? Its length is, if I want to take the length of U, then that's just the square root of U transpose U, and that's just the square root of 3. Similarly, the, square, the length of V which we're going to need in a bit with square root of V transpose V, which is square root of what's the transpose of V multiplied by V. That's minus 1, so 1 squared plus 1, so that's going to be 2. Okay, so U divided by its length is just 1 upon square root 3 being multiplied by U, which is 1, 1, 1. So that's my vector Q1. I can write it in a... Um, you know, in a combined form, which is 1 over square root 3, 1 over square root 3, 1 over square root 3. But this is a bit clunky, so I'm going to prefer this this way of writing the Q vector. And Q2 is going to be V divided by its length, so 1 over root 2 being multiplied by minus 1, 0, 1. Okay? So that's my... So now I have normalized them as well. So normalized... I get Q1 is equals to 1 over root 3, 1, 1, 1, and I get Q2 to be 1 over root 2, minus 1, 0, 1. And now we can check that their lengths are going to be 1. So let's just check the two properties that we started off with, that they are going to be orthogonal to each other. Orthogonality is something that we've already checked. You can check it again if you want. So Q1 transpose Q2 is going to be 0, that's for sure. And what is Q1 transpose Q1? Okay, so I have, I'm going to leave 1 upon 3 outside. Take the transpose 1, 1, 1, and then have another 1 upon 3, and then 1, 1, 1. That's Q1 transpose being multiplied by Q1. The number 1 upon 3, number 1 upon 3, I can just leave it outside. So 1 upon 9, I believe, right? That's going to be, sorry, 1 upon root 3 and 1 upon root. That's 1 upon 3. And then what's going to be the dot product? The dot product is going to be 1 plus 1 plus 1. So that's 3. And so if you cancel them out, you get Q transpose, Q1 transpose, Q1 is 1. So there, at least Q1 is, has been successfully normalized. That I know for sure. Okay, what about Q2? Let's just check. Q2 transpose Q2. That's just 1 upon root 2 minus 1, 0, 1. 1 upon root 2 minus 1, 0, 1. So multiply the scalars together. That just gives me 1 upon 2. And you can take these two, which is minus 1 times minus 1 is 1, 0. And that's just 1 plus 1. So that's just 1 again. So the Gram-Schmidt process is successful and we have a bunch of orthonormal vectors, okay? All right. Okay, um, so what's the time? The time is three. Do have an hour. Um, let's see, do I, should we do another example or 
let's see if maybe we can add another vector to it which is independent so let's try to add another vector to this process so if i had another vector a b c if i had a third vector let's say 2 0 2 i'd say independent 1 plus 1 is 2 i think they'd be independent so that shouldn't be a problem okay to make this zero this should be either this should be two or this should be one so if i take this two multiplied by two then that's not going to work and if i take this one that's not going to work okay so they are at least independent at least so i think okay and so if you want the third vector w what we're going to have to do hmm, should i add this maybe not let's not mess this up over here maybe let's add it to over here okay so let's say c is 202 two. if i want a third vector w then i will have to do c minus u transpose c upon u transpose u and minus v transpose c upon v transpose v and then vector v okay let's try to do this either get an answer or not let's see 202 two. Minus what's u? U vector was one one one, and the vector v was minus one zero one. So let's try to do this one 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 with uh, trans dot product with this. That gives me two plus two four, divided by uh, u with itself was three, and then this vector is one one one. Minus v transpose c is going to be minus two, plus two. So that's zero. That's interesting. So this is going to be just Wait, was this minus one zero one? Okay, so this is probably not going to work because I've chosen this vector C is already, so this is not going to work. C is just some alpha times V. So it's C is in the same line as V. So we don't have three independent vectors. I was wrong. Maybe if I can change a one here, then that will give me a vector that's not a scalar multiple. Okay, so let's try this out now. So I have minus 2, plus 1, and plus 2. So that's just going to give me 1. Divided by V transpose V is 1, 1, 1, that's 2. And then we have minus 1, 0, 1. Okay. So I wanted to avoid this now. I've successfully done it. Okay, so what's the result? The result is 2 minus 4 upon 3 plus half so these computations get slightly ugly or messy and i don't really like fractions so one minus four upon three minus zero and the last one is two minus four upon three and a minus half so the w vector that is going to be orthogonal to the v and w is going to be so two minus four upon three plus half hate to do this but whatever okay so six i believe is this all scale them up by six do this fractional computation so this is six and i get uh, 12 minus eight and plus three and this one is just going to be three but let's just do it by six as well so make a common fraction six this is going to be two minus uh eight and this is going to be six again let's just put a one upon six here and get rid of these sixes and then that's just two blah, blah, blah. sorry this should be six yeah and we have what do we have so six so this is 12 minus eight minus three so the w vector is going to be one upon six times four plus three seven minus two and so my three one okay so that's my w vector so the orthogonal vectors are one 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 v equals to minus one zero one and w vector is one upon six times this seven minus two one and now we had already normalized these two so if you want to find the normalization of these three Q1 is just going to be, this was 1 upon root 3, 1, 1, 1. And 
q2 is going to be 1 upon root 2 minus 1 0 1 this is something that we've already done q3 now is going to be this vector divided by its length and its length can be computed let's compute its length w the length of is going to be is 7 squared upon 6 squared so 49 upon 36 plus 4 upon 36 plus 1 upon 36 square root and that's going to be actually ugly but I don't really want to do this 54 upon 36 so 54 square root 54 upon 36 which we can write as so if you want to divide it that's going to be 36 upon square root 54 times this vector w right so we wanted to do q3 remember it was just w being divided by its length w was this vector 1 upon 6 times 7 minus 2 1 so 6 and 6 cancel out we get this vector 6 upon square root 54 times 7 minus 2 1 so the gram schmidt process can easily get ugly because there's lots of square roots going on um, and there's dot products being taken and that can happen that's fine okay but you should know how to do this and see what's happening um, we've discussed orthogonality we've discussed how if you started off with a bunch of vectors that are independent at least then you can get um, from independent vectors you can get to so the Gram-Schmidt process just takes independent independent vectors to if you can apply the Gram-Schmidt process that gives you a orthodontal um, vectors okay um, and we can see that in this example when we started off with 1 1 1 2 3 and we ended up with these two vectors what really happened was um, <clears throat> if you think about it so we had two vectors in the three dimensions in the three dimensional plane uh, in the three dimensional plane we had three vectors which were 1 1 1 so vector a was so vector a was 1 1 1 and vector b was 1 2 3 and these two vectors if I draw they look something like maybe 1 1 1 so that's that's one vector okay uh, just draw that with a back line so that's one vector something like this that's a vector and 1 2 3 1 2 3 that's something that's going to be something like this and so these two vectors are of course independent and we can construct a plane out of them so these two vectors span a plane and it's going to look something like this right and then what we did was we constructed two other vectors which were q1 and do this so i got q1 which was 1 over root 3 1 1 1 and q2 which was 1 over root 2 minus 1 0 1 so the first vector is actually the same as vector a but it's just been uh, reduced down so that its length is 1 so this is this is q1 right and the second vector q2 is this minus 1 0 1 so if I try to see it, that minus 1 nothing in the 0 vector and then 1 so that's going to look something like this um, minus 1 0 1 actually nothing in this minus 1 something like this so it's going to look something like this okay it's going to be like q2 so minus 1 nothing here and then 1 here so q1 q2 these are the two vectors that I've drawn but of course these two q1 and q2 are still in the same plane so if you think about it if you make a vector a so if if I make matrix a which was 1 1 1 and 1 2 3 and if I make matrix Q which was um, 1 over root 3 1 over root 3 1 over root 3 and minus 1 over root 2 0 1 over root 2 what these two matrices are is that this matrix has a and B as its column and this matrix has Q1 and Q2 as its column and the uh, idea is that the column space both of these the column space of a is exactly the same as the column space of Q they're both spanning that same plane if I call this the plane then this is just the column space makes up this plane B right but the nice thing about Q is that this is an orthonormal basis 
and A was not an orthonormal basis for matrix for this plane. Okay, so that's what we have gotten. And let's just uh, take this one step further and discuss it in terms of the factorization. So we've seen basically what happens is if I look at A and Q, these vectors are clearly related in some way, right? These matrices are related and they're indeed related. And they're related in the following way that if you think about it, Q1 was, well, not Q, but the vector that was used to create Q1, which was U, was actually just the matrix. This Q, Q1 was just, okay, let's not confuse the issue. So vector U was the same as vector A, right? So it was vector U was along this line, right? And vector V was constructed by B minus um, some, some factor times U. Right? So it was in the plane that was, so you can see that maybe, maybe you can see that this vector was in the line that was, it's a combination of P and a combination of U, or maybe you can see that P is a combination of V. So I can write this as, let's just write this as U transpose V upon U transpose U. And then we can write B as V plus U transpose V upon U transpose U. U. So this B vector is, a combination of the first vector and the second vector, right? Uh, but the first vector was just a combination of the first vector. So I can actually make this connection that if I take matrix A, right? So this was column A and this was column B. That's matrix A. It's related to Q in the following way. So this is Q such that this first column is Q1, the second column is Q2. And I can achieve this by um, left-hand side equals to right-hand side by multiplying this with another matrix. So this is, I can multiply this with a matrix called R. And that factorization can happen by, let's uh, do a squared example, so A, B, C. And I have Q3 in it. Right, so three vectors, three vectors there. And this, the nice little thing about this R matrix is it looks something like this. It's an upper triangular matrix. It's an upper triangular matrix. And it looks something like this. So this is Q1 transpose A, zero, zero. The second entry is Q1 transpose B, Q2 transpose B and zero. The third entry is Q1 transpose C, Q2 transpose C and Q3 transpose C. And what this, um, what this matrix is really saying, and I've of course just put this matrix in front of you and not giving you any uh, details as to how this is, where this has come from and that's, we, I'm not going to get into this, but I'm at least going to justify it for you that have not done something, uh, uh, you know, illegal or something that's not allowed, you can check that when you multiply these two matrices, you will get these two, uh, you will get matrix A. So for example, if I take this Q1, Q2, Q3, if I view this as a, if I view QR as each column of QR as a linear combination, so maybe if I see Q1, so if I see, I can get the matrix A, by taking the linear combination. So I can get Q1 transpose A. If I just multiply the first column of R with this, with all of them, so this is Q1, Q2, and Q3. So what do I get? I get Q1 times Q1 transpose A, Q2, Q3, which just gives me Q1, Q1 transpose A, and that's going to give me um, my claim is that this is just going to give me the column A. And we can perhaps, maybe we can check this out. So uh, maybe in the case of A, it's going to be extremely easy. So A is just, if I can plug this in, 1, 1, 1, and equals to Q1, Q2, Q3. So Q1 is just 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 
1 over root 3, q2 was minus 1 over root 2, 0, 1 over root 2, and what was q3? We, we did discuss q3, which is an ugly little vector, but might as well put it here. So 6 over 54, 7, so 42 minus 12 and 6. So 42 minus 12 and 6 divided by the square root of 54. Doesn't really matter. I'm not going to verify this third column, but just for the sake of completion. So the first entry is Q1 transpose. So what's Q1 transpose? Q1 transpose is going to be, so let's say Q1 transpose A is going to be, what's that going to be? That's 1 upon root 3, 1 upon root 3, 1 upon root 3. And we want a dot product with 1, 1, 1, and that's just going to be 3 over root 3. 3 over root 3, which we can write as root 3. Okay, so this entry is root 3, and the following two entries are three. Okay, so again, let me just repeat what I'm doing. I'm writing down this matrix Q. I'm taking the first column of A and the first column of R and verifying that I indeed get this thing. And now it's easy to see that. If I take root 3 and multiply it with this matrix, so this can be written as root 3 times the first column, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, 1 over root 3, taking it as the linear combination of the columns, plus 0 times the second column, I don't even need to write this, plus 0 times the third column, and that's just 1, 1, 1. So that verifies, right? So at least I've justified to you that this is going to give you the same, the right result. And the reason I've written it down, the reason I've told you this, is that A equals to QR is sort of, another factorization. So A equals to QR is a factorization factorization of A into an orthogonal matrix, an orthogonal matrix Q, and an upper triangular upper triangular matrix R. And you might recall that we've done a similar factorization before. We have done A equals to LU, LU factorization before, and the LU factorization is just, we get this lower triangular matrix, and this is an upper triangular matrix, right? So upper triangular and lower, lower and upper triangular matrix. And A equals to QR is a special kind of factorization where you get um, the orthogonal columns, orthonormal columns in here, and an upper triangular matrix in here. And these are the these are the entries of R, right? So these are just dot products. Um, if you figure out Q, then you have figured out the entries of R. The entries of R are just going to be lower triangular and Q1, Q2, Q3. And the way you're going to take the dot products is first you're in the first row, you're just going to take the dot product of the first column with the first column. Second column, you will have the dot products of B with Q1 and Q2, then dot product of C with Q1, Q2, and Q3. So that's how you get this R matrix. Okay. All right. Again, uh, then you should be asking why I'm doing this, and that's the question that I'm going to answer now. So why? Let's see. Let's talk about when we were solving solving AT AX is equals to A transpose B. So we saw two things. We saw that when A equals to Q, then this is easy to do because then it's just X equals to Q transpose B. So that's nice. When A is just an orthogonal matrix, right? That was the first thing. Now I'm saying that when A is not an orthogonal matrix, you can make it into the product. You can factorize this. You can factorize this as A equals to QR, right? So A had independent columns. So if A has independent columns, then do Gram-Schmidt on the columns of A on the columns of A to get A 
equal to QR. And why would you do that? You would do that because then solving this equation is easier. How is it easier? Let's see. A transpose AX is equal to A transpose B. I can replace A by QR. So I get QR. QR transpose QR X is equal to QR transpose B. Okay, what do I get? Maybe I can move to the next page. Don't need to crowd everything here. Okay, so, right. So over here I have QR transpose, which by the rule of product of trans transpose of a product, you know that this is R transpose Q transpose and QRX is equal to R transpose Q B. Okay, that's fine. Now, Q transpose Q is the identity. I can get rid of that. So that gives me R transpose Rx equals to R transpose QB. Okay, now I multiply, multiply by R inverse on both sides, or rather R transpose inverse. Okay, so I have R transpose inverse, R transpose Rx, and R transpose inverse, R transpose QB. And what do I get? This inverse and this R transpose gives me the identity matrix. On the left-hand side, I have Rx is equal to, on the right-hand side, I have Q transpose B. So this is a transpose, okay? Um, QR transpose is R transpose, Q transpose. There's a transpose sign here. Okay, so what is this telling me? This equation is telling me Rx is equal to Q transpose B, and this is a nicer equation to solve. Why? Because R is upper triangular, and Q transpose is just taking the transpose. You already have, already have Q, so taking Q transpose is easy, which means this equation can just be solved by back substitution. So the only real problem in solving this equation is finding this QR factorization. As long as you can do this QR factorization efficiently, then you can solve the system efficiently by just doing back substitution on Rx equals to Q transpose B. So that's the nice thing about having an orthogonal factorization. So that's the idea. So you take A transpose A X is equal to A transpose B has been converted into Rx equals to Q transpose B. A nicer equation to solve. You don't have to take an inverse. Remember that when we were taking projections, so if you want to solve it as it is, you have to solve by taking the inverse A transpose A, inverse A transpose B. Now you don't really need to find an inverse. Just find Q, find R, do a back substitution, you have the result, okay? So the real cost, so the real cost is just doing A equals to QR, just finding A equals to QR, and that's done by the Gram-Schmidt process. Okay, that's, I think, enough for today. So let me just summarize today's lecture um, in some key points, even though uh, I try to make it as simple as possible. So the key points where we started off by discussing some orthogonal vectors and orthonormal vectors. We defined what an orthogonal vector was. Uh, we defined what orthonormal vectors were. Uh, we defined how we can make an orthogonal matrix out of orthonormal vectors. Um, I also mentioned that the term orthogonal matrix is just reserved for square matrix at the convention, even though uh, you can make rectangular matrices as well out of orthonormal vectors, but those are not called orthogonal matrices, right? But even they have the nice property that uh, W transpose W gives the identity, right? 
the W times W transpose will not give you the identity. Okay, and the properties of orthogonal matrices are that, is that they preserve the length of the vector that they have been multiplied to, they preserve the dot products in that space, um, and they make solving A transpose AX equals to this normal equation solution becomes really easy to do, okay? And the way if you don't have already, if you don't have orthogonal vectors to deal with, we have a process that can turn independent columns into orthonormal columns. So that's just the bridge. That's the process that we needed. You do Gram-Schmidt process, first you orthogonalize them, then you normalize them. So you have some formulas to do that. And the formula has a sort of, is a bit complicated, but it has a pattern that you can follow. You just take the vector that you're dealing with and you start subtracting the projection. So you subtract the projection on U, then you went to W, you subtract the projection onto U, and you subtract the projection onto V. If you have another vector, then you subtract the projection onto U, V, W, all three of them. So you have more and more terms of the Gram-Schmidt process for a larger number of vectors. Okay. And I believe that's it. And, and I showed you why uh, we care about this, uh, because it makes making this, solving this equation quite easy. You can view this as a factorization as well. So we can see this A equals to QR as a similar factorization as A equals to LU, right? And that makes solving this matrix, this equation, very easy. Okay, so I think that's two modules done. Um, really, you can see A equals to LU at the end of one module and A equals to QR at the end of the second module. So that was equations, these were linear equations linear equations and systems, and then these were sort of M greater than N sort of systems. I can maybe call this an M equal to N. That's what we are doing in LU factorization. This is what we were doing when we had no solutions to deal with. And in the next module, I think we're going to go into uh, details of determinants, something that we've ignored so far, and eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And here we are going to deal with diagonalization. So again, this is A equals to LU, A equals to QR. Now we're going to do something like A equals to um, the diagonalization, which is, how do we write this? U, D, V transpose, or something like that. Okay. Uh, we're going to see how to do that in a bit. Okay, have a good day.